the diagram you're looking at is the difference between a feed-forward neural network and a recurrent neural network. So a feed-forward neural network is all the kinds of neural networks that we've mainly discussed so far. So that's just the ordinary fully connected ones and convolutional neural networks. And then this is a recurrent neural network. So just looking at the one on the left, uh, you can kind of take everything that we've learned so far and encapsulate into this diagram. Because basically all neural networks that we've looked at so far work something like this. You have some input, which can be uh, you know, an image or you know, a set of features, a feature vector from Wekinator, anything like that. And it gets multiplied by a bunch of weights, which may be sequentially in layers, right? But it's really just a bunch of weights being multiplied. And you get something on the other side, a label or maybe a fee, uh, like another kind of feature vector with higher level encodings, um, or you know something something like something. All of the things that we've looked at so far, all of the examples fit this kind of template. So with a recurrent neural network, the instead of having just a set of weights, we have this kind of a hidden internal state, which is a function of time. And I shouldn't say uh, to. to really not so much a function of time, but actually a function of, uh, of itself. So every time we pass a data point through the neural network, it, upda it gets updated. So it, it operates on sequences of inputs. So every time x goes in here, h of t, which is equivalent to the weights, it changes. Uh, so the hidden state of the network changes, and therefore the output that it produces also changes. And so now we're dealing with neural networks that are not sort of fixed or static, right? These are static. Once they're trained, they behave in a deterministic way and always give us the same y for any given x. But with recurrent neural, net neural networks, we'll see that's not true. And the way it accomplishes that is by, uh, as Rachel alluded to yesterday, sort of these feedback loops. It allows information to kind of flow back into itself. Uh, and that allows it to have a sort of flexibility that we haven't really seen before. And we'll see that that lets us do all sorts of interesting things. The main advantage of recurrent neural networks is that um, they allow us to operate on sequences of data. So not, not just a fixed length vector x but, uh, and, and y, but it allows us to attach sequences on either side of this. And the sequences are not fixed in length. They can be... They can be varying lengths, and that means that we'll be able to take uh, sort of architecture of neural networks to the next level. Uh, we'll be able to operate in many different kinds of contexts that we haven't seen before. And in many ways, they're the most exciting area of, of research in deep learning, particularly, because they, um, uh, you know, potentially they, they are able to model real-world scenarios in which, you know, things are more, much more dynamic. The, the state of things is changing. Um, so that's what makes them so interesting. Uh, so again, yeah, just, just to sum up what I mentioned, feed-forward neural networks, which are the kind that we've looked at so far, you know, like our digit recognizing system and our covnets, they all look like this. Um, and they have these, these properties. There's, it's static. Um, you know, they're trained, and, but then after training, they're static. And the activations within them are useful for many sort of applications. So uh, the way that this is done in the, mo in the simplest case looks something like this. And this, this looks kind of weird, but I I'll explain it kind of how it goes. So a recurrent neural network is set up like this, and this is the simplest kind. It accepts a, an input, and then now instead of just one set of weights, we have actually three sets of weights. There's one here, here, and here. X gets multiplied by those weights. And then, then it gets added to, well, here, let me, let me first actually discuss this H of T. This whole times W is sort of replaced by this, like H of T times W. So the hidden state gets multiplied by a set of weights, and that produces a set of Y. And then that feeds back around in the next time step and becomes H of T minus 1, so like the previous hidden state. So then when we get an input x goes in, gets multiplied by these weights, and added to the previous hidden state getting multiplied by another set of weights and then added together. And that creates our new hidden state. So then this keeps looping back around and around, and every time we pass in a new x, the hidden state gets updated. 
and uh, that means that y is constantly changing, um, or which is uh, which is to say the, the relationship between x and y is changing. Um, so this is again like an empty vessel. We can think of it. It doesn't necessarily. It's not necessarily meaningful by itself. But when we see how we can set it up to do various things, you, we'll see why this is an advantage. It almost sounds like the answer to the way the universe works or something. You know, like you're talking about like this hidden stuff, it's like dark matter. Yeah. Well, um, Jürgen Schmidhuber, um, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. How do you say Jürgen in, in German? It's like you again, Jürgen. Jürgen. Um, he invented LSTMs, or one of the inventors of LSTMs, which is a type of recurrent neural network we'll look at in a second. Um, but he says that recurrent neural networks are essentially universal computers. They, in theory, given infinite com computational resources, can simulate any arbitrary sequential function and therefore they can they can simulate the whole universe um, so that's that's some pretty heady LSD stuff lstm long no, short-term memory no, oh yeah no no not quite uh, <laughs> so um now check this out so let's say we have this hidden state at a time step zero what happens is that the next time step h of zero updates the next uh, h the, the this is kind of going in time now at time step one, we have the recurrent neural network, and its hidden state is not only a function of x of one, but it's a function of the previous hidden state, and so on. It just kind of goes in, in however many steps you want to go forward into the future, it'll keep on updating. And so h of three is a function of h of two, which is itself a function of h of one, and so therefore h of three is a function of every previous time step before it. Uh, which is important because uh, it's not commutative. So, like, if you um, uh, if you pass in a sequence of data, uh, it's it, if you uh, reorder it, it'll have a different h of three would be different. If these if these um, if like these x's were reordered, the um, you know this thing is not commutative. Basically, it's not just it's not just the sum total of the changes from each of the input vectors, but the, se but the order matters, uh, which means that we can operate on sequences. So the simplest kind of sequence would be text. Um, so typically, uh, the way that we will, and we'll do this later, like a tutorial on how to generate text uh, with recurrent neural networks, and I'll, I'm going to describe how it works. So uh, if, you, if you represent text, you know, we've been look all, all the time we always work with numbers, right? So a good way to turn uh, letters into numbers is using what's called a one-hot vector. One-hot means you have a vector of zeros and then just one of the elements is a one. And it's a one for the element which, you know, which le whichever letter it is. So for example, if we make x, our input, be the character h, uh, then our, the, our encoding would look like this. It would, it would have a one for where h is and zero for everything else. And we don't just have the characters of the alphabet, we also have a character for space. Um, also, there are other sort of magic characters that we sometimes need, like a new line character or a tab character, and various things that refer to like operations in text. And so if we want the network to go from, to like when we pass in an H, let's say we want it to, we want to train it on hello world, the sequence of text, hello world then we would make x h or equal to the one hot vector corresponding to the character h and y be the one hot vector corresponding to the to the uh, one hot to corresponding to the character e right and then um, and then we could do this in so if then we would do the same thing for e to l l to l l to o o with a space space w right and so on all the way until the end Right, and so then, um, if we then what we would have is something that looks like this: we have the, this recurrent neural network which is unfolded in time. So we've taken all of these time steps and we've unfolded them like this, and then we have the sequence of text "Hello World," and then on the input side and on the output side, it's the whole thing shifted by one. So H to E, E to L, L to L, L to O, O to space, and so on. And then we train it, 
on on this sequence of we we um, we saw and by training it I mean you know we give it all of the, this whole sequence and it figures out the proper set of weights in the hidden state such that uh, it's able to accurately go from you know it's ac ac it's able to accurately map from the input to the output. Um, I know again this is like first day of covenants maybe flies over the head but this will make sense when you've read a few. Um, like good blog posts about it, and actually the one by Andre Karpathy um, called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks is uh, kind of kickstarted a lot of the excitement about LSTMs and generating text. It's a really lucid article, so I definitely recommend that blog post. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the idea of training on text. Um, now, the kind of neural network that uh, the kind of recurrent neural network that we are typically using for most of our text generating experiments is called an LSTM, which stands for long short term memory. We're not going to really discuss like the internals of this too much uh, because it get, gets into some pretty mathy, maybe beyond the scope of this course. But the idea is that LSTMs are a type of recurrent neural network, so I'll kind of use them interchangeably because LST everything that we say about RNNs applies to LSTMs since they're a type of recurrent neural network. Uh, but they're a type of recurrent neural network that makes a few innovations that allow it to hold a sort of long-term context memory. So uh, by using these things called forget gates and output gates, they're kind of these like internal gates that allow information to maybe flow or stop or be forgotten or discarded. Uh, and so it just has more architectural flexibility, but it remains um, like differentiable, which means that we can use calculus on it, on it, which means that we can train it using gradient descent. Um, so can we maybe close the door? Yeah, I think that'll be useful. Um, so, um, but again, we're not going to talk about the internal dynamics of this too much. Uh, and LSTMs, like if you hear me talk about LSTMs, these are the type of uh, networks that we've been using to do the text stuff. So uh, again, this is a really nice blog post, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks. And this is a lot of this is taken from there. This is from um, last May, um, this blog post made by Andre Karpathy, where he explains like how RNNs and LSTMs work. And then um, and it actually codes, co uh, does like a very simple coding exercise where he implements it in Python which is something that some of you may be interested in doing. Um, so he describes it in a little more detail than, than I do, so I definitely encourage you guys to read it. Uh, but I'm going to show you some, some of the things that were generated from that blog post and then other projects that people kind of riffed off of. So this is a Shakespeare LSTM. So it takes the entire corpus of Shakespeare, uh, which is all of his plays and his sonnets and everything, and then it starts producing uh, just random Shakespeare. So if you read this, uh, it'll be like, Viola, why Salisbury must find his flesh and thought, that which I am not apt, not a man and in fire, to show the reigning of the raven and the wars, to grace my hand reproach within, and not a fair our hand, that Caesar and my goodly father's world. So you see what's going on here. It's just like, it's kind of rambling in the language that, that sounds a bit like Shakespeare. If you read it for long enough, it doesn't really make any sense because it's not kind of reasoning. It's just it's just generating this styled text. Yeah. Is it making up words? Then? Yes, it is actually. So this is the interesting thing, right? We generated that we're, we're we're going one character at a time. So we're we're predicting every character as a function of the previous characters. So it tends to produce words that are that appear because usually it'll predict you know characters that appear together, uh, but sometimes it does actually create words <laughs> because, uh, and words that look like fragments of other words or, um, you know, th and this is sort of a property of them. But what's amazing about this is that it's not generating word by word, right? It's not actually predicting each word, it's predicting each character. And, and mostly real world. Mostly real world words, yeah. It does, yeah. So you see that it has like viola, the character, at the top, and then, and then it knows like, because if you feed it all this uh, Shakespeare text, it has new line characters, and it has this sort of structure that the LSTM will learn. It will learn that like, oh, it seems to like to have a person's name, colon, and then the whole stanza, 
and then a new paragraph, and then it's another person's name, and it learns this sort of macro structure. And we'll see more examples of that in a second. And this is what distinguishes them from things like hidden Markov models, which maybe some of you are familiar with. Those are also used to generate text, usually word by word, but Markov models understand only like a very fixed length. They, they don't remember anything past, let's say they were trained on four grams, like, like sequences of four words. It's just, it's like totally has no short-term memory at all, um, or doesn't have any long-term memory. So it, it forgets things like stanzas. So you, a, recurrent, a, a Markov model would not necessarily preserve this kind of structure so well. Uh, and this is another good example of that. If you train that on XML, right, it preserves the, the end tags. It preserves the indentations, and it remembers to close the page tag. So page and then end page. So that's, that's pretty cool, right? It learns that there's this sort of like, oh, every time I open a new bracket, I need to close it. And the thing is, it doesn't always do that. So it's, it's sometimes it, it forgets to do that, and maybe not, and not here, actually, I guess. This is actually a pretty good one, but sometimes it will, it will forget sometimes, but it does a pretty good job, um, impressively so. Um, this is trained on the entire source code of Linux. Uh, so this is, this is all just random C, C code, and uh, it won't compile. So if you try to actually run this in Xcode, it won't work, uh, because it declares variables that it doesn't use, and. <coughs> You know, it, like, it uses variables that were never declared and so on. It makes all sorts of mistakes. Uh, but it actually does uh, produce like realistic looking code. And one really funny thing about this is that if you look at the Linux source code, it recites the entire license, the, the GPL, the, uh, like new G, the new GPL, which says the, you know, this is free software and, and it's licensed for any use whatsoever, blah, blah, blah. If you look at the actual source code, it has that at the top of every header file. And so when this produces uh, text in the style of Linux source code, it does that also. It learns like, oh, every new file has the entire, uh, uh, the entire license written at the top of it. Uh, and it recites it by heart. So that's kind of like these just funny little artifacts. Um, this is another thing, and this was made by Justin Johnson in the same lab. They, uh, they trained it on LaTeX, which is this format for generating math. So like when you create equations in math, like in math papers, it's just text. There's a, a sort of markup language that does it. And so you can produce fake math. And so if you read this, it looks like a math paper, but it, to it doesn't make any sense at all, right? So, and the, I think this was like written, uh, this is like trained on algebraic geometry papers or something or, or topology. And so it's just total nonsense equations. It's a unique morphism of algebraic stacks. Note that arrows equals, you know, it's just, yeah, right. Well, the, again, the equations don't actually make sense, but but it, it looks it looks sure. like math. But and, I mean, like the linguist, like Chomsky is like grammar is so hard to learn. You need to have like a grammar module in the brain yeah. or something. But it seems like it learns the grammar fine. It just doesn't make sense. Um, well, I don't know. Does that mean it learned it fine? It's hard to say, right? Well, if the grammar doesn't make sense. The grammar makes sense, though. Like we, well, I guess we have C that doesn't make sense. But yeah, I mean, none of these equations have any basis in reality. <laughs> that, that's that's I don't know. To me, that's different. Yeah. If like a noun, a verb, probably I don't know. Like grammar, you can distinguish from the semantic mm -hmm. elements. So mm -hmm. I assume it could be something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it makes graphs too. Also, these sort of nonsense graphs. <laughs> Uh, recipes, and I think we looked at these in the first week, right? So unsweetened, chocolate canned, medium potatoes, onions. It looks like it's starting to build like a, a curry or something, tarragon. But then it starts to use ingredients that it never listed in the first place. So sour cream into egg coloring, drain first pans in the large bowl, um, pierced crumbs by handles. Uh, yeah. When ice cream can be softened dumplings. So, so <laughs> I think it comes from like Epicurious or something. Um, Samim, and I got to talk to him. Maybe he'll be here next week. Um, he generated um, our uh, TED Talks. So if you, it's just trained on the transcripts of all the TED Talks. There's been like a few thousand of them or something. 
And so this is like a generic TED talk. The real problem with the death for the universe is the predictions of the size of the other. There's not a problem. They are manufactured by governments to be a choice. So we should really get money at the summit of a mail. The reality is that there is a problem and the fish have learned. They have been tracked in the world, but we do something to possible change the next genes between a lot of books that we might never read. The sole knowledge is that, yeah, it just goes on like this. And you can produce like infinite amounts of this, you know, just Ted junk. And, uh, and, and he made, posted a video of, of Schmidt Huber who gave a TED talk and he just over, he overdubbed it with, um, with like, uh, like the, the, you know, synthesized voice. Uh, reading this stuff, so it's just kind of bizarre. <laughs> um, you can create, t lots of people have made Twitter bots. So this is Deep Trump. You see that he's been deep dreamed. So that's Donald Trump. He's been deep dreamed. This is just going top shelf for all of this. And I suspect this one is like, has a little bit of supervision going on because it seems too good to be true. But if you can, you can read some of these. So right now, think of this. We owe China $1.3 trillion. We owe Japan more than that. We have gun laws. I'll bring back our money. This is so total nonsense. Can we, pe can we get people to vote to get rid of New Jersey? They don't talk about how it was beautiful. It's a great question. This is a movement. So it's just like Donald Trump nonsense. <laughs> yeah, that is finest, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, also like there's an RNN, there's a Bible. There's one that's generating uh, Bible verses. Um, I trained it on my Gmail last year, so this is like, should I am happy to be applying of the audio correct? I'd like to need a, yeah, it's just, know what she's every, best Jean. Carol has a few hours. This is just my email. And look, it makes entire URLs, right? And, and I think Mata, Mata mentioned this, like did you, you saw the URLs that like actually work? Some occasionally it'll produce a URL that actually works. That would be a neat project, trying to produce like URLs and see if any of them are, see if any of them don't produce 404s. Uh, yeah? How do you train it on your Gmail? You have to extract all your Gmail and put it in a huge text file. Um, which, which can be done, there's software for extracting G Gmail. And actually you can just download it from, um, so Google allows you to request your, your whole Gmail archive, which they give to you in a gigantic JSON file. Oh, you know, Facebook as well. Wait, Facebook wait. as well, yeah. Twitter also, you, most of the tech companies that collect your data, they by law basically have to give you the option of being able to download your data. Um, and otherwise they wouldn't give it to you. So let's always keep up the pressure. Um, the, uh, but yeah, it's a really huge file because it'll contain everything. So if you're on mailing lists and like, it, I think even maybe you can request to not have the spam in there. Uh, but then, but then um, yeah, it's a little messy, but you can, in, in practice, like we could potentially make email bots for all of us. You just have to um, extract your Gmail. And if you have something else like, uh, yeah, you could, if you, if you tweet a lot, if you have like, you know, 30,000 tweets, that's probably enough to produce compelling text. Uh, the, although it'll, it'll take a lot of tweets um, because it's so short. Have you ever tasted the Well, so define distinguish. It'll, it'll, it'll probably have parts of both. Um, yeah. That would be interesting how it deals with multiple languages. It'll probably just, you know, you'll see words from both languages appear. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Andreas, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, this is, a, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I'd love to hear that, yeah. Do you have an example of that? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear some. Yeah. Andres? So, uh, when talking about this, and, and it's kind of like making up new words. What if you don't want that? Could you make it operate on, on a word basis instead of a character basis? So the problem with, so there is actually, and, and Sukanya and I were looking at this, there's, there is a repository that does word RNNs. I think it does it in a clever way, like using embeddings. The problem with doing it on words is that there are so many unique words that your your encode your like one hot vector would have 
like a you know how many elements tens of thousands hundreds of thousands so it's a it's the whole thing with characters is that there's a very fixed length there's a fixed size of them there's only so many and and therefore they um you know we they're they're computable basically um, as a feature vector so with words it becomes a little tricky um, this is also the reason why I think it's a little difficult to do with languages like Chinese or, or, or Japanese because there's so many um, there's so many unique characters. I think someone did do this uh, with Chinese, and I, I haven't seen. Um, but but yeah, the the if you have a small token size set of possible tokens, we call them tokens, like different um, possible characters, then it seems to work pretty well. Um, and that's and it's important to, to call them tokens because it doesn't have to be characters, right? They, the encoding the one hot vector can represent anything. So, and we'll see a few examples of that actually. Um, just mm -hmm. how the images, like the covenants, found um, like kind of useful activations of like detector for images. Are there mm -hmm. ways that you could use neural network to come up with activations? Yeah, uh, and I don't have it in these slides. Uh, but what ends up happening is that like these neural networks, they, they have like, they're called cells sometimes. And they're kind of like, they're almost equivalent to these like, um, these filters. They're cells that are sort of looking for different kinds of things that have some sort of a high, um, so like, 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 for example, one um, cell might be a, um, a cell which counts the number of characters within a line. And that cell is sort of responsible for figuring out when to put in a new line character. If you read the blog post, um, Karpathy's blog post, it talks about some of these um, somewhere down here. You can monitor these. And then a lot of them are junk or not interpretable. But some of them are, um, yeah, like this is a cell sensitive to position in line. So it shows the value of that cell as a function of the character that you're on. And so this, this one is like seems to be heating up when it gets close to the end of a new line and it's probably responsible for figuring out when to create uh, new new lines. One is cells that turn on inside of quotes so it deter detects that you're inside of a quote so that it remembers to close the quote. Um, or like in code, you know, uh, conditional statements. Um, yeah, you can see lots of these. So so this, this kind of stuff is, yeah, there is something like this. It's a little bit hard to work with, but but it's there. Um, so um, Kyle McDonald did uh, did made emojis out of uh, out of LSTMs because emojis are SVG files. They're vector graphics, right? They're it's just text. You can open it in a text editor, uh, and so you feed it to an LSTM, and you can produce like junk um, junk emojis. But it's a copy of another project. Basically. Sorry. It's a copy of another project. The one that was yeah, I, 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 Alison Parrish uh, did also some generative emojis, and I think he he um, I think Kyle uh, mentioned her, but yeah, uh, but using a different method. So yeah, you can do and there's like emoji glitch stuff, uh, but this one is is using LSTMs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so this one is made by uh, this fellow Adam, Adam Gitke. Uh, who made uh, generative Super Mario levels. So uh, this doesn't look like text anymore, but if you think about it, like uh, anything that can be described as a sequence of objects can be, uh, can be predicted with a network. So a Mario level is just a sequence of you know, obstacles and baddies and Koopas and whatever, and uh, you can produce totally new ones generatively using an LSTM. It's nauseating, actually. <laughs> Um, the author Robin Sloan, who wrote uh, Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour uh, bookshop, made a science fiction writing, short story writing assistant. So if you watch this, it's a text editor that gives him suggestions for lines to add. So he's writing, take us home, she said to the math computer, the computer said, give me a suggestion, and it, and it, gives, it, and it gives the author a bunch of suggestions for um, quotes, and so you can do this kind of like um, interacting with with the LSTM and using it as a sort of like assistant for a writing assistant. Uh, which I am, and this is kind of interesting because if you think about it, like 
what's, you know, these things don't make so much sense, but maybe they might be good enough to kind of use in an assistant role. So maybe we can kind of use these to help us write journalistic articles or something like that. Maybe they're able to kind of capably make suggestions for us. And this is kind of like, you know, will the machines kind of do jobs autonomously or will, will they help us? Is that easy for you to set up for real? Uh, he has the software online, I think. I don't know how easy it is, uh, but because I haven't tried it, but, but it does exist, yeah. Sorry? It's a character level. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, because it's good, but it's still predicting character at a time, but it, but it looks like good, makes words. Um, and also, um, Ross Goodwin at ICP did something similar, and he actually made, I think it's not actually working right now, he took it down, but it... Uh, does the same thing except it's interactive on the web. Um, and I think he might have disabled it because it was like, it's a server side operation, it's kind of expensive. Uh, but you can look this up, it's called WordSynth. Um, and um, and he, he also made a, um, a dictionary bot. So this produces definitions. So one of the things that you can do with these LSTMs is you can seed them. And seeding means you hard code the first sequence, like the first few characters, and uh, this one, and then it'll, it'll produce more, you know, following that sequence. And so if you train it on a dictionary, it will learn how to make dictionaries and you can seed it with a new word. So you can ask for the dictionary, of, uh, you can ask for the dictionary entry of love, a result of a person's or animal's response to a problem or difficulty. She loved the music of the new employee. Um, and, and this is called Lexiconjure, and you can see this online. Okay, so now let's talk about architecture stuff. Um, so sequence to sequence is another way that we can use LSTMs. And, um, and what I mean by that is that, like, suppose you have this recurrent neural network, and uh, you will input a sequence of inputs you know, let's say three in this case, but then you don't care about what the output is, you just discard it. By doing this, you're conditioning the RNN, right? You are, uh, at each time step, it's, you know, being changed according to the sequence of characters that you're feeding it. And so uh, you, may, you may try to condition it with a, an input sequence and then ask it to cr create an output sequence after that. Uh, and and this is interesting because now we see that like we don't necessarily have to um, think of the inputs or outputs as fixed in size. This, you know, because recurrent neural networks can unfold infinitely, you can create inf uh, you can create arbitrarily sized sequence input inputs of sequences. So let me give you a few examples of that. This is what is behind uh, most deep learning efforts to create language translations. This is a bit of a joke. Um, this is like. This is not real. This is coming from some Google image thing that I found where, yeah, it's translating Yoda into English. Anyone into Yoda language? <laughs> um, but the idea is that the, the promise of, of using LSTMs and recurrent neural networks for language translation is that instead of, you know, the old approach to doing, to translating languages, you know, if you've ever looked at Google Translate or something like that, um, over the years, it would look really funny because it was trying to translate the grammar of one language into another, which can be very difficult. And the way it does that is by, you know, suppose you're doing it in English, it will take whatever, it will figure out what the lexical tree is of the sentence that you're parsing, um, which can be very inaccurate. And then it will translate each part individually and then rearrange it into the target language's grammar. And, uh, and translate all the words individually. And so that's why, and that can be, that's a really problematic process because it makes lots and lots of assumptions. Languages have tons of exceptions within them. Uh, and so the whole thing is sort of like a huge architecture that creates weird translations um, in many language pairs. So the idea with 
um, using recurrent neural networks for this is that you can use this technique of sequence to sequence prediction to uh, completely get rid of any sort of pre-parsing that has to happen. You're just, uh, you're just conditioning a recurrent neural network to go from one language directly to the other without any intermediate engineering, uh, which is really helpful because intermediate engineering is costly and inaccurate, uh, and, it's, and it has to be done for every possible language pair. Here, we, all we need is just a, if we have a huge data set of two what's called parallel corpora. So if we have two texts, one text that has been translated into multiple languages side by side, we can uh, use that to train a sequence to sequence language to language translation system. So people have used this to translate like um, Middle English into New English or, or Modern English or vice versa. Uh, that's one, I think there's a repository that does that, uh, which is really neat. Um, and um, you may, yeah, you may be interested in that. I think in the future, the idea is that um, there's a lot of speculation that natural language processing is going to be totally revolutionized by deep learning. Uh, it's already been an area of hot, hot, sort of, it's a hot topic within deep learning, language processing. And uh, potentially, uh, we might see things like language translation kind of go to the next level. I think it's, it's uh, speculated that within the next few years, there's no reason why we shouldn't have like almost perfect language translation systems um, that are, you know, sort of a quantum leap better than, than the ones that we have today. So that will be really interesting. I think, let's say in five years, you might be able to just go to, you know, anywhere, talk into your phone and it will, and it will translate it into whatever the language of the country that you're in and do so very accurately. Um, so those are... Yeah, you can do it, uh, and yeah, they're working towards that. It's still a little flaky, though, like especially for a lot of language pairs, yeah. and also the speech to text is not not perfect. So those two things getting better um, are likely to really lead to a you know uh, that that's a billion dollar app um, that's going to happen in a few years. So who knows? Maybe one of you will start it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget me. No. Anyway, um, uh, so RNNs unit to sequence. So now we, instead of uh, conditioning it with a single, uh, with a sequence of inputs, we condition it with a single input, which can be anything, right? So, so for example, we can take a recurrent neural network, which is producing output sequences of text, and condition it with the activations from a convolutional neural network. So, um, and this is where things get really interesting, right? Now we're starting to combine these architectures together. We're starting to combine covenants and recurrent neural networks together to do uh, things like this. So image captioning, this was done by Karpathy and, and Fei Fei Li uh, at the Vision Lab at Stanford. So they took a huge data set of um, labeled images, so images which have human labeled annotations to them, and design an architecture in which you can label an image, like describe an image with natural language uh, in the following way. You take a recurrent neural network, which is producing text, and you condition it with an initial input vector coming from a, a convolutional neural network. I think I have the, no, I don't have it. I thought I had the architecture slide. So you take, it basically takes the activations from a, con a convolutional neural network and it designs the RNN so that it um, so that that's one of the inputs that it takes. So when it receives these activations, the RNN is conditioned, uh, and then you can sample text from it, and it will sample text that seems to indicate what's happening inside of the image. I know that sounds super like uh, that might be flying over your heads, and it definitely flies over mine. So. Um, kind of take that, take that as, as you, as you may. Wait, wait, wait. It's like, it's like, okay, so here's your covenant right here. And you take this image of this man in a straw hat and you analyze it with a covenant. And then you take those in that the feature vector that it produces, the, the activations, and that becomes your, one of the inputs to the initial uh, <laughs> hidden state of the recurrent neural network. And then you, then your input vector is the start token. So start writing something, 
and then it will it will uh, sample a few words of text. This is actually done on words, not not characters, because it has a limited vocabulary. Uh, but it will sample words, and then at some point it will give you a special end token, and then you stop. <laughs> Again, that's a really really um, you know sort of high level explanation for something that's super research heavy and this has only been demonstrated in the last two or three years so that's kind of the best that we can transmit the, the science at the moment uh, but just look look out for it um, I'll show you a few examples of that um, so this is again this is from the sa their same research so just a few examples these are all autonomously labeled by a recurrent neural network op, um, and the covenant on these images so man in black shirt is playing guitar Construction worker in orange safety vest is working on road. Two young girls are playing with a Lego toy. Boy is doing a backflip on a wakeboard. Right, black and white dog jumps over the bar. I think these are cherry picked because it doesn't always do a good job. Um, but it's pretty impressive, right, that this is being done autonomously. And all of these sentences, you know, none of them actually appear in the training set. They're new sentences. They're, they're um, you know, sequences of words that don't necessarily appear together in the training set. So we're teaching neural networks to look at an image and describe what's happening in it. So that's really amazing. I mean, think about all the applications of that, right? We're constantly doing that in our daily lives where, you know, journalists have to look at images and describe what's in them. Um, you know, to be able to take pixels and get words from them could be a very, very useful task because words are much higher, better value for us, much more computable. So if we're interested in searching for pictures which have a certain semantic uh, quality to them, you know, we're, we, we can search for them semantically, basically. Um, so that's kind of like, and these systems are not very good yet, but they're getting much better. And they're really, really recent. This is research from, la from last year. Um, absolutely, yeah. And actually, we're going to see that in, in just a moment. Uh, but yeah, these things can operate actually pretty quickly. And so yeah, they have applications just as you mentioned. So for accessibility, helping blind people see, like describing to blind people what they're, what, what, what's in front of them. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, yeah, is very, very much something that you should expect to see. So basically, this is DanceCap plus another. The, no, this is actually, this is before DanceCap. That's before DanceCap. Yeah, so this is, this is captioning the whole image. Okay. And now I'm going to show DanceCap in a second. Dance yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is a neural net. You can find it online. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah, simpler so version. Yeah. So this is so the software for this is called Neural Talk, uh, or Neural Talk Two that Karpathy made anyway. And there's a couple of versions of it. And it, yeah, you can so you can do this. Yeah. Uh, it, it, DenseCap is basically the next generation of this. So if you already have DenseCap, it's um, it's it's presumably better. Um, but it's the same size. It's really the yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Kyle took us on a walk around Amsterdam last year, so he just, he just uh, made an open frameworks app uh, which would call Neural Talk repeatedly, so he's using Karpathy software and labeling like images from the webcam as he walks around. It always just does this to, like the unk 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 because it's trained on the MS Coco data set where all the words that it finds are labeled that way. Um, when he did this, the the I think the model was not as good as it is now, so a lot of these captions don't make a ton of sense. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. Is that online? Do you kind of... Yep, Neural Talk is online, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another cool repository called Neural Storyteller, uh, made by a researcher named Ryan Kiros in, in Toronto. And this is <clears throat> it, this is um, a similar thing, except it's, it's, con it's conditioned to, to write stories about images. So not sort of describing them, but write stories. So... So this is an image and then it goes, you know, we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind. She was in love with him for the first time in months. So she had no intention of escaping. The sun had risen. So 
So you see what's going on here, right? Um, it's, it's, it's trained on a data set of, I forget what the, this initial one is. I think, I think this was trained on, on romance novels or something. <laughs> um, Samim trained it on Taylor's, oh no, no, this one is a, this one is a romance novel. So Samim took Neural Story Storyteller and trained it on, I think, one set on romance novels and another one on, on Taylor Swift lyrics. And, uh, and told little stories about pictures. And we can look at some of these. So we were men in a tense position at the end of the meeting. And I looked up at my best friend. Of course, I had no intention of letting him go. I don't know what else to say, but he is also the most beautiful man you ever meet. Yeah, so romance novels. So that's OK. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's a lot more of these. So like, um, yeah. Yeah, this one's really good. He was a shirtless man in the back of his mind. I let out a curse as he leaned over to kiss me on the shoulder. He wanted to strangle me, considering the beautiful boy I'd become wearing his boxers. Um, this is... We had to act much of the group, despite the fact that people were surrounded by thousands of people. A few more times they were beautiful, and I wondered what was going on in New York. I didn't want to tear my eyes away from Bill. I didn't figure out it was Bill. I guess it knows Bill Gates, yeah. yeah. So, like, this picture in and of itself. Yeah. It's a really, yeah, exactly. Some of the, this is, is this, I want to say this is either, this is somewhere in South Asia. I don't know why they have a plant. <laughs> um, yeah. My man was within a woman and she gave him a questioning look. I don't know what, anyway, yeah, it's just. <laughs> Um, yeah, lots of, th lots of things. Um, pretty funny. Um, okay, dense cap. So dense cap is the same thing as the image captioning, except it actually takes, uh, it actually is able to describe subsets of the image. So it finds sort of regions of interest, and then it describes those individually. So here's a bottle of water, a cup of coffee, a plate of fruit, a fork, banana slices, and a person sitting at a table. It's amazing, right? It's like getting a, it's getting a set of objects, and it uses a very similar system, except now it's a covnet that has one extra layer, which is this. Do I have it? Yeah, here it is. It has this like extra. We don't have to look at this closely because I don't fully understand it either. But it has. It's a covnet that has this extra. What's called a localization layer, which means that it's trained not only to uh, give you activations, but it's trained to find subsets of the image. Um, that are that seem to be particularly coherent, and uh, and then it produces captions for all of them, and the whole thing is trained jointly, and so here's a bunch more examples. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so yeah, you can see some of these, you know, a building with a lot of windows, train on the tracks, people walking on the sidewalk, a tall light pole. Um, I used this um, recently, and I showed you this in the first week. Excuse me. Um, so this is the, the um, we looked at this video, right? So it's the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot, the humanoid robot that's trained to cross rough terrain. And I just captioned the entire video. And um, it does it frame by frame. And then I have this sort of little really hacky script that will merge captions that are the same in consecutive frames because it tends to come up with the same thing in consecutive frames. Um, a tree with no leaves, a tree trunk. Uh, what is this? This is a, It's like a person riding a horse or a person on top of a snowboard or skis, something like this. So it's pretty funny. Uh, and the neat thing about this is that it doesn't ever. Uh, oh, and you see the whole word unk thing here again. The boss there it just says the word unk. Here it's going crazy. It's seeing a lot of stuff. The man with the blue jacket. A small box in the floor. At some point when the guy starts to mess, the guy with the hockey stick starts to mess with the robot. And um, what's really interesting is that it, it always calls the robot a man in a motorcycle or you know a person on skis or things like this. Because the, the training set that it that is trained on, it doesn't have any robots or machines in it. So it doesn't have that in its vocabulary. So that's kind of interesting, right? So this, this thing will learn to talk the way that we teach it. Moon white motorcycle. This is very Terminator-esque. And he gets up. It's pretty scary. I think, I 
It's very powerful. That's totally real, yes. Yes? Oh, yeah, I think he chose the good ones, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Definitely chose the good ones. Um, this is, I, I really had fun with this. Like, I trained dense, or I, I um, applied dense cap to Deep Dream videos because, and what's cool about this is now this is like two neural networks fighting, I guess. Uh, Deep Dream is a neural network that's producing images that look like images that came from somewhere. And then Dense Cap is captioning them. So it's like there's a head of a cat, or oh, sorry, a head of a dog, you know, nose of a bird, um, things of this sort. So it's kind of funny. This, is, this takes the whole adversarial networks thing to the next level. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so just a few other um, interesting... Uh, applications of recurrent neural networks uh, and you know you can use it to do sort of what's called like um, semantics semantic segmentation or semantic object parsing where um, you know this is kind of like contour tracking in computer vision but it's able to parse like coherent objects of things and and, and make analogies between them so like both of these people are wearing a vest and you know this is a, their head you know, so there's like, you're able to get the same part of, in multiple instances of, of the contour. So this is really neat. So it's, it's parsing them, but also giving you, um, you know, equivalent, uh, like an, uh, basically analogous object parts. Uh, you can use an LSTM to generate handwriting. So this is all machine handwriting. I think the top one is real. I want to say, and then the next few are, are, are like different handwriting styles applied I to. I forget that the. In the it's basically, just writing a letter and just keeping it, and then writing yeah. it in a computer writing it in one right now. Oh. But this is not just generating like a handwriting, it's just the word itself. Yeah, yeah. The word and it writes. I forgot, actually. Uh, I think it makes the word. More. I no. I think. I think it's told to write this, and then it just applies the handwriting style. I forgot. You could use that There's one online where it looks at handwriting, and it doesn't even comprehend the words, but it'll make up fake words. It like. That might be. Yeah. It could. It could. Yeah. Oh, there is an online demo of this. Yeah. Somewhere. Um, okay. Just a few more examples. So sequence the unit. So this one's really neat. Uh, so let's say you can input a sequence, but then output a single unit. So this would be, we looked at unit to sequence, so that was image to caption. This is caption to image. So let's say you can condition, you can, you can um, basically input a, yeah, you can input some sort of a caption and have it produce images a stop sign is flying in blue skies. A herd of elephants flying in the blue skies. I don't know what it is about the blue skies here. A person skiing on sand clad vast desert. A toilet sit seat sits open in the grass field. So, so these are really tiny right now, uh, but it's always getting better. And I, I suspect that maybe in a little while you'll see realistic looking images being produced from captions. So that's really interesting, right? Because we see the inverse, we just looked at the inverse process. So having both of these can create like sort of uh, entire systems which have end-to-end -end and like mutually, mutual information exchange between different kinds of media. Uh, so we might, I don't know if what I said just makes sense, even to me, but basically like you can imagine system, ensemble systems that, that exchange information across different media. Um, so that's a really interesting thing. I think this software, I don't know if the software for this is, is online. It might be, um, but it's, but it's, it's um, yeah, you can't really do much better than these small tiles, but pretty interesting. Um, yeah, right? I always want to do this thing with like, I mean, you know, like, like, these are really tiny and you have to like go and like it's a really high quality system. What do you call that? Uh, so like you, you know, like you can have like the little, 
Yeah. Could be. Uh, you could probably do super resolution of these and then make them bigger. Um, and yeah, there's some stuff they're doing some sharpening here, I guess. Anyhow, um, something how long, to look out how long for. Do you think it would take to generate? I, I'm not sure actually. I have to read the paper. Yeah, I haven't I haven't tried it. Uh, this is a system called visual attention, which actually uses again uh, like it. Uh, so suppose you know it, you want to train a uh, a CubeNet to recognize images, but the images have some sort of an order associated. Like let's say you want to read house numbers, then um, the way that you might do this is condition a recurrent neural network to sort of position a region of interest tile around an image and then read it in order. So like if you want to pull out house numbers, you you know, we do this in our in our minds, right? When you when you read a number, you kind of go from left to right or something with your eyes. So here we're designing we're designing visual attention systems that are able to kind of move their their um, you know the window that they're paying attention to, they're able to kind of move them and it's using a recurrent neural network to do so. And figuring out house numbers, and this is a really, uh, I guess, a really prominent paper from I think a year or two ago. And this is basically the opposite. So this is called draw, and this software I think is online. Here you see that it's drawing house numbers. So there's a data set of house uh, images of house numbers. You, you know, you see that these look like you know what you would see on, on someone's front door, like their their address, and it's producing, it's drawing the numbers in order. And actually, it's going in reverse order, but um, uh, but this is interesting, right? And that's the inverse process, so drawing things in a certain order. Uh, and then sequence. The sequence is the last kind. Of, I don't think I have an example of this, um, but I have uh, just a few more slides that um, of interesting projects. So um, this guy on Twitter, Hardmaru, uh, drew uh, made a recurrent neural network produce fake. Kanji, and um, he's, I think he, he um, he's Japanese um, American, and he um, trained a recurrent neural network on uh, like vector graphics, like SVGs of, of real Chinese characters, or the, you know, Kanji, so that's like the Japanese name for Chinese characters, and how to produce fake ones. So it's, it's a sequence of, of brush strokes creating fake characters, right? So you mean, can you read any of these? <laughs> There's one I almost real. Really? Which one? Uh, the one on the right, the second row. This one? Uh, the one on the right. Oh, so just this right here. Oh, the, the, the one the left. Oh, right here? Yeah, this one. What, what does it look like? <laughs> it's, it's not real, but looks Yeah, yeah, it looks close, right? Maybe they're like, they look like archaic characters. Well, in any case, these are fake. So like with, with, um, with a book from the sky, I was actually producing fake versions of real characters. These are real versions of fake characters, so you can't read these. <laughs> um, but you seem to like have a little colony. And you basically just do all these kind of fake things and then just say, that's the world. That's yeah, right, world. yeah. And he, he wrote a really good blog post about this. And he made a Twitter account called Neo Kanji, which is just making these, like, every day. Um, and the blog post is really good. So it explains how he did this. And, and I, I forget if he has, I think he put some code up also that does this. Um, so yeah, that's, oh, it is a real character? What does it mean? What was it translated to? Can you throw it through Google Translate and maybe see what it says? <laughs> oh, there's a character saying, do the right thing. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a type of tool for agriculture. Type of tool for agriculture, okay. Actually, it's even more tricky than what you because it seems like he, he tries to create characters that say some some kind of English uh, yeah, expression. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. 
like a part of an English expression translated into uh, yeah yeah there is a, yeah and that's what the Twitter account's doing every day it's like producing characters that that have some sort of a meaning it's like a dictionary okay so people have asked a lot about our audio stuff so I'm gonna mention a few applications of LSTMs to audio uh, they uh, and these are these are the links that I've included so there's been some attempts to generate sound with RNNs. Um, and uh, oh, I forgot to mention a couple other things. Real, l l let me mention real quick. Um, th this was recent. Um, so this was made by this uh, director, Oscar Sharp and, and Ross Goodwin, who I mentioned. They trained an LSTM to write uh, like a science fiction story, and they made it into a movie starring the guy from Silicon Valley. So now this is an LSTM generating a script. I don't have the audio on, so. Um, so just listen to me closely. <laughs> you should see the boy and shut up. I was the one who was going to be a hundred years old. I saw him again. The way you were sent to me. That was a big honest idea. That was a big honest idea. I am not a bright light. Well! So yeah, it's basically, they just trained, they made an LSTM make a script, and then had it get acted out. And this was um, featured by Ars Technica, so it's been, this kind of, this is when all this stuff just like, um, yeah, is, uh, yeah, one one year ago, like this blog post by Karpati, and, and one year later, we have all of the all of the applications that we've seen, movies and Ars Technica. You see the turnaround time between research and application is, is uh, like shockingly fast. So that's something interesting to look out for. So do you know Agave? Like it's just a mm -hmm. um, Okay, so just sound, some sound stuff. Um, uh, this guy, John, John Glover, generating sound with current neural networks. So, um, you know, LSTMs, can, we've been looking at, you know, they, they generate sequences of things. So one thing you would try to do is generate sequences of audio frames or even crazier sequences of samples of audio. So individual samples that you have 44,100 per second typically in audio. And um, so I'll just go to like one of the, um, this is a, yeah, you generated a piano. So let's see how, this is an actual piano, I think. So you just took the note of the piano and then tried to, Resynthesize it with a recurrent neural network. So maybe not super convincing just yet. Um, I, be, I think he's taking a much more scientific approach to this, so trying to actually synthesize samples. Another way is to kind of do like a sort of granular synthesis. Uh, let me see if I can find. There's a, a repository, and I use the repository by this. Uh, someone named Matt Vitelli, uh, who tried to generate sequences of audio. And I'll give you a few. I just tried a software out last year. So this is trained on Chopin. At first, I was really excited when I heard that. I, I realized that it's kind of overfitting so it's like sampling from the original audio and so it's not necessarily as, as good as it sounds this is the same thing but and I think it's mostly sort of doing a granular synthesis so it's not it's not really as as is that interesting. The same code as one? no it's different uh, look it's look for GRUV groove um, and this is the same thing trained on a vibraphone sample. Sometimes it has nice artifacts. There's also been attempts to do this with MIDI, which, which makes a lot more sense because MIDI is just, you know, it's, all, it's like text characters, right? So it's much more computable. And so let me see if I can find the TLDR of this. Yeah, so here's the... So this is trained on a huge amount of MIDI. And so now it's, it's, it's exactly like our text generator, right? Our text is trained on characters of text. This is trained on notes of MIDI. And so it has a lot of the same properties. Short-term scale. 
code for this. So for those of you who are interested in producing MIDI, what's the name of this one? Uh, just look up this link. A hexahedria. Just look up hexahedria composing music with net neural networks. Even if you look up composing music with apparent neural networks, I think you'll find it. So this is just like some more settings. another attempt it's more recent actually uh, this was trained this fellow um, Kun Wu Choi who trained it on uh, the like you know the the real book so that's a huge book of jazz standards so this is and this is doing chords actually so I think this is trained not on notes but to generate chords so jazz chord progressions and again I, I the, the software for this is online <laughs> That's the main thing. So wait, another attempt. What's that? Oh, that's right. to know how you did it, right? Wait, let me let me put this on. Um, so this is generating Metallica drums. Uh, it says in the implementation details. I mean, again, there's no easy answer to that. It, it depends on what you want to generate, how many instruments there are, things like that. A lot, though. Uh, MIDI is, is, is abundantly available, though, and there is data sets of it, so um, it's definitely very, very much feasible. Um, okay, and that's all that we have for recurrent neural networks. So why don't we, what time is it? Um, so let's do this, like let's take a quick break and then after the break we can do a tutorial on generating text with LSTMs on the terminal instance. So what's LSTM for? Oh, long short-term memory. Okay. Yep. Recurrent neural network. Yeah, it's a type of RNN, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's like pixel RNN type stuff. There, yes, um, there is, and it's unclear if there's you know for for like it might have certain application areas that are that are useful, uh, but otherwise like draw like there has been attempts to draw things uh, you, by treating pixels as RNNs, um, but um, yeah, it's all it's in, in its infancy. Okay, so let's take a quick break. <laughs>